to the Food and Health Programme and to Beef and Lamb for inviting me to come and talk to you today about my most favourite topic in the whole world, um, infant and childhood nutrition, but obviously with a focus on iron. Um, so I have no conflict of interest to declare, just that this is my um, youngest daughter who was given a year's supply of steak from <laughs> Beef and Lamb. Um, <laughs> no, I'm only joking. I have no conflict of interest to declare. Um, the outline of my talk, what I'd really like to um, sort of get over to you uh, in this brief 30 minutes that I have, is really to look, about, look at what we do know currently about the iron status of infants and toddlers in New Zealand, um, look at how we may optimise their iron status, and really look at uh, a study that's just come out recently from the US in terms of what I think is quite hot uh, in terms of this topic for um, infants in particular. So iron in infancy and early life is absolutely vital for normal growth and development. And I really don't need to have to stress that enough because you've already had these superb talks from Bob and Catherine who've told you how important iron is for health. So you can imagine for a young infant who's growing very rapidly, iron is even more, more um, important. The requirement for iron at this stage of life is around about 0.9 to 1.3 milligrams per kilogram of body weight. So if you sit there and think about how much you weigh and you get your, um, obviously because you do it in your head, get your phone out, the calculator function, and you multiply your body weight by 1.3 milligrams per kilogram of your body weight, that's an awful lot of iron. You won't be eating that. Um, so um, infants and toddlers need a lot of iron for normal growth and development. It's not surprising then that infants and toddlers that don't get enough iron fail to grow. They fail to thrive. Um, also, their immunity can be compromised. The other thing that iron is incredibly important for in early life is brain development. It's amazing to think that out of in utero, the most rapid uh, uh, time that your brain grows is in the first two years of life. So 80% of your brain growth has occurred by the end of the second year of life. Um, so you think about a baby, you know, when a baby's born in that first, and also during that first year, and you think about their proportion of their head to their abdomen to their legs, about a third of their body size is their, is, is their head and their brain, and then obviously the rest of their body grows. So that brain is doing an awful lot of um, developing. Um, often we don't think about iron being intricately, in, intric 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 intricately involved in, in the brain. So what is it doing in there? Well, it's very important for myel myelination within the brain, within the um, uh, pathways within the brain. It's very important for neuronal growth and differentiation. Uh, and it's very important in neurotransmitter regulation, and particularly um, the production and pathways of dopamine. The brain barrier to iron actually starts to close off around about two years of age as well. And the actual brain iron itself, the homeostasis of it, is independent of the body's iron. So it's really important that the brain the, uh, is maximised in terms of its uh, optimised the amount of iron that it receives during the first two years of life. Because if it doesn't get enough iron in during this time, actually the, the, the effect of that is irreversible. You can't then cram in the iron uh, in later years in life. Now, obviously, it's quite hard ethically to do studies where you would deprive an infant of iron, make them iron deficient, and then follow them up being iron deficient for a number of years to see what happens to them. The only really elegant studies that have been done um, on this area were done by Betsy Losoff, in, uh, who's an American, um, on a cohort in South America. And what she did probably would be nearly 20 years ago is she looked at infants who were iron deficient, um, infants who had iron deficiency anemia and infants who were iron sufficient. Uh, they corrected the infants who had iron deficiency and iron deficiency anemia, but they'd probably been, had been iron deficient or, iron def or had iron deficiency anemia for a number of months before they were, were treated. They have subsequently followed those infants up over a long period of time and published data on those, the children. They're now nearly six, more than 16. And interestingly, the children who had iron deficiency, or infants who had iron deficiency anemia in early life, um, do have impaired cognitive development, and they have lower educational attainment uh, during um, the school age, age years. So we know that there is a long-term impact of being, having iron deficiency anemia in early life. 
So how, what dictates an infant's iron status? Well, probably the most important thing is the amount of iron that an infant is born with. So basically birth iron stores. Um, those iron stores the baby gets from their mother. So most of the iron is transferred in the last trimester of pregnancy. So if you're a full term uh, normal delivery or been born full term and normal delivery, you've got pretty good iron stores that will last you to around about six months um, of, of age. But obviously if you're born prem prematurely, then those iron stores that, you're, that you, know, you should get from your mum in that last trimester of pregnancy are less. So if you're a premature infant, your iron stores will run out a lot faster within the first year of life. If you're also born large for gestational age as well, your iron requirement is somewhat higher. So the amount of iron that you get from your mother in the last trimester of pregnancy isn't, quite, isn't as much as a baby that's born normal for gestational age. Now you can see that if you look at the components of iron dynamics in the first year of life, you can see that after about um, four to five months of age, there's a huge increase in blood volume and therefore a huge increase um, in haemoglobin and a huge requirement for iron. Um, this really cannot be met by breast milk alone. So breast milk um, obviously is the most optimal source of nutrition for an infant and we now recommend that all infants are exclusively bread fed, breast, <laughs> breastfed until six months of age. The iron is very, very well absorbed in breast milk. Even though the content's quite low, it's really, really highly absorbed. It's a bit like kind of the heme iron, if you like, of, of milk. Um, but around about four to six months of age, with the depletion in storage iron and the inability for the breast milk iron to provide enough iron for the infant around about this time, obviously complementary foods need to, to, need to be added into the diet. So iron status is, is dictated by the amount of iron the baby uh, is, uh, gains from their mother at birth, um, the source of dietary iron, whether they're breastfed or receive infant formula, and then the age of introduction of solids and the timing of those introduction of solids, and then the types of solids that the baby's introduced to. And we've already uh, had these uh, fantastic explanations of the difference in bioavailability of the different sources of food sources of iron, and I'm going to talk a bit more about those and how they affect the infant. Uh, and then very importantly, iron status in the first year in particular is very much governed or dictated by a uh, uh, growth, growth rate. So infants who grow more rapidly in the first year of life have a much higher requirement for iron and are much more likely to become deficient in the first year of life. So what about infants and toddlers in New Zealand? What do we know about their iron status? Well, gosh, if you go back into the literature many, many years ago, right into the 1950s, there has been a number of, or over 16 studies reporting um, iron status of infants and toddlers. And nearly all these studies show that even early in those years, we have a significant problem with iron deficiency in this age group. And the, the prevalence rates varied considerably, and a lot of the prevalence rates were very high, but a lot of the samples were what I call opportunistic samples. So a lot of the samples or, or the children were um, from hospitals or from clinics, so the infants and children uh, were being admitted to hospital or, be, or being seen by um, clinicians, and they had actually other, other um, illnesses. So they might have had gastroenteritis or respiratory illnesses. And while they were there, they had a blood test taken and they were shown to be iron deficient. So it's kind of a bit ch chicken and egg. You don't know whether if they, they were sick, they were iron deficient because they were sick, or they were sick because they were iron deficient. So they, they weren't true what we call prevalent samples. But in saying that, all of the 16 studies that had been conducted in this age group all showed very significant iron deficiency in those populations. Some of them ranging to about 60, from like 16% to 60% um, iron deficiency. Um, what we do know over this time, though, is iron deficiency in this age group has become a lot less common in other countries, particularly in the US and Northern Europe, but m much more so in, say, the US and Canada, where health initiatives have taken place to try and address iron deficiency in both mothers and infants. Uh, and I'll talk about that in a, a bit later. So what about more contemporary studies um, in New Zealand? Well, there have been two major contemporary studies in this age group, which have been what I call true uh, population prevalence um, studies. So they've 
Both of them have gained a, a randomised sample from a healthy population of infants and toddlers. Uh, one of them, which I was involved um, with, was what, um, conducted in Auckland, uh, and we basically um, uh, recruited a random sample of six to 23 months olds by going and knocking basically any map of Auckland, throwing some darts at it and finding some random street addresses and then walking up the street and knocking on people's doors and saying, have you got a six to 23 month old in your house? And if you have, can we have them in our study? And then doing lots of horrible things to them like taking blood and um, asking lots of rude questions of, about what they, what they ate. Um, so we, we also ethnically stratified our sample to ensure that we got uh, equal representation of Māori, Pacific and European babies in our study. So with that, we got 416 infants and toddlers recruited into the study and we found in that sample 14% of them had iron deficiency and 6% had iron deficiency anemia. Now, around about the same time, our cousins in the South Island conducted a very similar study, the only difference being that they didn't ethnically stratify their sample. So their sample was predominantly um, European. Um, and this was conducted by researchers at Otago um, University. And they collected their sample from Dunedin and from Christchurch, and they had 226 infants and toddlers in their, in their study. And of that, iron deficiency was um, prevalent in 11% of the sample and iron deficiency anemia in 6%. So really quite high prevalence rates when you compare them to the US in this age group where the prevalence rate of iron deficiency is only about 2%. So pretty high um, levels of iron deficiency. <coughs> Now, obviously, with our study, what we wanted to do is, one, look at the prevalence um, of, the, uh, of iron, uh, iron deficiency, but we also wanted to try and understand a bit more about some of the factors that I sp um, spoke about earlier that may impact on iron status in this age group. So we wanted to look at um, some of these factors, so iron stores at birth, iron requirements, and iron losses, and available iron. So our aim was to determine the interactions between risk factors for iron deficiency. In terms of the prevalence of iron deficiency um, by ethnicity in our, in our study, you can see that um, it was very significant for Pacific and Māori uh, children. And Māori children were three times more likely to be iron deficient as compared to two and a half times for Pacific as compared to European. Now the other, which I, I hate in studies, other, uh, but the other ethnicity were really children who belonged to predominantly Asian ethnic groups and also a number of refugee children were in this study as well. So they're kind of a bit overrepresented in this sample, so I don't really want you to kind of take too much notice of this, but they were five times more likely to have iron deficiency. So what about their diets? Well, we, were, we, we got the um, mothers or caregivers to keep four-day weighed food records um, on these um, infants and toddlers, and we then analysed the, their diets, and we compared them to both the recommended dietary intake for this age group and also the estimated average requirement for this age group. And this figure basically just shows you the percentage um, of reported dietary intake below the RDI and the EAR in both the 6 to 12 month age group and, I don't know, does my pointer reach over there for people sitting over there? Yep, and the 13 to 24 month age group. And you can see for the RDI for the 6 to 12 months, 55% of them did not meet the RDI. Now, the RDI is set at a population level, so it's quite high. But even when we look at the estimated average requirement, 32% of them didn't meet the EAR for iron. And in the older age group, 65% didn't meet the RDI and 38% didn't meet the EAR. Now, very often in studies, as Catherine has alluded to, you often do not see a relationship between di actual dietary iron intake and iron status because you can't account for the differences in bioavailability and the types of dietary iron that somebody consumes. But we did try and look at this. Um, when, what we first of all did is we were quite interested to look at what um, food sources of iron infants uh, consu consumed compared to um, toddlers. 
And what we found that most of the iron in the infants obviously came from breast milk and infant formula. So it contribu contributed about 58% of the total um, dietary iron intake. Meat and meat dishes is only 2% and fruits and veggies were 6%. Cereals, 4%. When we compared it to the older age group, to toddlers, we found that 5% of the dietary iron came from meat and meat dishes, 17% from fruits and vegetables, and a whopping 41% um, from cereals, and some of those were fortified um, cereals. And we did have some significance between the two age groups. Now, when we try to look at dietary iron intake in association with the biomarker, so using ferritin, what did we find? Well, we didn't find any association with dietary iron intake in the 6 to 12-month-old age group, but we did show some associations in the toddler age group. Um, and I'll just talk you through this. So the kind of mustardy colour is a positive association with uh, serum ferritin. And the red uh, boxes is a negative association. So what we found for all of the 12 to 23 month olds, there was a positive association with total dietary iron intake and serum ferritin. For, for New Zealand European infants, this also remained um, significant. But for Māori and Pacific infants, there were no significant, was no significant relationship with total iron intake and log or, or serum ferritin. Um, for meat iron intake, there was a significant relationship between ferritin and meat intake for New Zealand European, but not for other, ethnic other ethnicities. And very interestingly, for all of the toddlers and for New Zealand European and Māori, there was a negative association with consuming milk and serum ferritin. Um, and then in terms of breast milk and formula, for those that were still consuming any breast milk or infant formula at this age, there was a positive association for all with consuming breast milk and formula and ferritin uh, and also for New Zealand European, but not for Māori or Pacific. So we did find some dietary factors, some dietary associations with iron status in this age group. The other things that we found also that were quite useful, we looked at dietary interactions and additive, additive interactions because as Catherine quite rightly pointed out, it's, it's not a good thing to be looking at single nutrients or single food groups. It's good to look at interactions overall. And what we found, that we found associations, for example, with iron status and consuming or not consuming infant formula, but we found those associations increased when we added other interactions into the model. So these are relative risks. So what I mean um, by here is if the infant consumed no infant formula, their relative risk of getting, being iron deficient was around about four. So they're four times more likely to be iron deficient if they consumed no infant formula in the first um, two years of life. Now, if we combine that with them also being of premature gestation or of low birth weight, the relative risk for that infant goes up to nine. So they're nine times more likely to become iron deficient. Now, very interestingly, too, if an infant's first solid foods that they're introduced to were homemade, they were three times more likely to be iron deficient. Now, we got a lot of flack for this data. I think some of you know about this because uh, the press got hold of um, these results and they basically the headline was, you know, homemade solid foods bad for baby causes iron deficiency. Totally out of context because we never said that. I mean, basically, the conjecture here could be that the homemade first solids may be things like pureed fruits, pureed vegetables, and not the use of rice-based, you know, iron-fortified fort rice-based cereals that could be protective of iron deficiency. And so we weren't saying that homemade first, so first, homemade first solids were bad. We were just saying that basically it could be that uh, that having some commercial food that's iron fortified could be protective but you can imagine that that got completely inflated and I got lots of hate mail too which wasn't very nice. Um, and the other thing that we found again which supports uh, the, my, what I said in the beginning about growth rate uh, during early life and its effect on iron status is we found there was this ad additive interaction with BMI 
So infants who had rapid weight gain during the first and growth during the first year of life and they had a BMI of excess of 18.5 kilograms per meter squared had a relative risk of seven. So they were seven times more likely to be iron deficient as compared to those with the normal growth rate. And again, we showed an additive interaction with no um, infant formula, so a very high risk of uh, around about 15. And then we found this other anomaly as well, where, again, this really would support what Bob said this morning about consuming fruit. So we found that if infants and toddlers were given fruit as a snack rather than as a main meal, they were more likely to be iron deficient. So again, what we took from this is the infants that had fruit at main meals were more likely to have uh, the additive effect of enhancing iron absorption from that meal rather than consuming it in, in, in isolation just um, as a snack on its own. So in all what we found, poor, poor dietary sources of iron in our study actually was associated with a risk of iron deficiency. Timing of fruit, using it as an enhancer uh, because of its vitamin C content was also uh, an important um, factor with regards to being a risk for iron deficiency. We found premature gestation or being of low birth weight increased the likelihood of being iron deficient in this population, but we also found being having a larger BMI and a more rapid uh, growth in the first year of life also enhanced uh, the likelihood of being iron deficient in this uh, New Zealand cohort of infants and toddlers. Now, again, our clever cousins down in the South Island went one step further with their study. So they found, obviously, a situation where uh, in Christchurch and Dunedin, they found a, a quite high prevalence rates of iron deficiency in this age group, and they decided to go and do something about it. So they designed this, designed this very elegant uh, uh, trial where they randomised 12 to 20-month-olds um, into uh, three groups. So one was a, a meat group, one was a fortified milk group, and the other a placebo group. Uh, and the meat group were given uh, uh, basically, in fact, I don't know, anyone, did you supply the meat for them? I think beef and lamb did, didn't they? Yes. Uh, they were given um, meat, uh, which equated to around about two servings of meat per day, so quite a lot of meat intake. Um, or they were given a fortified uh, milk, like a growing up milk, which was fortified with iron, and they were recommended to consume around about four to 500 mils a day of that. And then, <coughs> excuse me, there was a, a placebo a group. They followed these children up for six months, and they've got lots of very nice data on it, but I'm just going to show you the effect in terms of the primary outcome, which was change in iron status at six months using serum ferritin, and you can see nicely there was a significant association or increase in serum ferritin from baseline to the end of the study in the fortified milk group, um, and there was also a significant increase in the meat group, but not as great as the um, fortified milk group. And you can see with the placebo group, hmm, iron status declined. So a successful intervention there in this age group. Um, the age of introduction of solids is quite a debate currently in terms of iron status um, at the moment in the literature. So obviously we currently recommend or we've adopted the World Health Organization guidelines where we recommend that all infants are exclusively breastfed uh, to around six months of age. And when I say exclusively, we've also adopted the term exclusive, which means nothing else apart from breast milk, apart from medication, uh, for, you know, uh, prescribed medication. Um, now, some people are concerned that by adopting this guideline that we will start to see an increase in prevalence of iron deficiency in this age group because of the reasons that I've already um, alluded to. Uh, so there is this debate, whereabouts is the critical window to introduce solid foods to ensure that iron intake is optimised in this age group? So there is this raging debate in the literature still around this. However, I feel, interpreting the literature, that actually breast milk is probably adequate in terms of iron in a normal, uh, a full-term delivered um, infant to uh, around about six months of age. And the reason for that is, is I still don't think we really, really understand about 
the absorption of iron in the early years in infant development. And there's some good literature, animal literature, that shows that actually infants aren't very good at regulating uptake of iron intake in the duodenum until really around about six months of age. And that actually we should be careful about giving infants too much iron in those early months. Um, so I, I think at the moment I will stand on the side of caution and say that I think that the guidelines are right because I think that um, breast milk is the optimal nutrition for infants to around about six months of age. Um, but I still think we need to watch this space. What do we know currently about when um, iron-rich foods are introduced into an infant's diet in this country? Well, this is data, and you probably can't read it that well in the back there, but this is data from growing up in New Zealand, which is our most contemporary birth cohort study um, in New Zealand. So uh, we recruited approximately 7,000 women at 28 weeks of pregnancy, and we're now following up, the ch following up the children just before they go to school at four and a half years of age. And this is data uh, uh, that we collected at nine months of age, where we asked them uh, about, obviously, infant feeding and when they introduced solids. And so just to really point out to you that the median age of introduction of solids actually was around just under five months. So we've moved significantly in New Zealand, actually. I was quite impressed with that. But if we look at the, the, the things that contain good sources of iron, so meat, chicken and meat dishes were the median um, age of introduction was seven months um, in this cohort. Um, and then we look at baby rice, it was five months, and baby breakfast cereals, and the majority of these are usually fortified with iron at five and six months. So, you know, doing quite well, but I really think that we need to probably push along the meat to be almost one of the first foods to be introduced, obviously in a palatable form, um, to an infant's diet. Now, I promised that I would talk to you a bit about something that was hot, because <laughs> you've all heard all that stuff before. Um, so what's hot at the moment? Well, you cannot possibly talk about infants uh, and nutrition without now talking about the microbiome, because it's the hot topic of the, mo of the moment. Um, and what we know in terms of the human microbiome and in infancy is that it's very much um, affected so the infant's uh, acquisition of its own microbiome by the, how it was delivered, so whether it was uh, delivered via, via the vagina or whether a baby was delivered via uh, caesarean section. So that impacts immediately uh, on an infant's acquisition of their own <coughs> microbiome. But also early infant feeding is very important in terms of establishing microbiome. And we know that infants who are fed breast milk have a different gut microbiome and indeed a different surface um, and mucosal surface than infants who are fed infant formula. Um, but why, why am I talking about this when we're actually what we're talking about is iron? Well, very recently there was a study done in the US by Nancy Krebs and her group, uh, and it was published at the end of last year. And she did this very nice study where she looked at uh, exclusively breastfed infants. She recruited 45 of them, and she then looked, she randomized them into three feeding groups, so one group received an infant cereal with iron and zinc in it. Another group received an infant cereal fortified with just iron. Uh, and then the third group just received meat. And they followed these infants up um, uh, for a, a few months. And quite interestingly, first of all, I'll just talk about the effects of the different complementary feeding regimes on their iron status. You can see that in the iron zinc uh, fortified breakfast, uh, fortified cereal rather, and the iron fortified cereal, they had a dietary iron intake over the months that was a lot higher than the group that just received meat. So total dietary iron intake was, was much greater. But when you actually looked, again, you won't be able to see this at the back of the room, so I'll, I'll talk through it. When you actually look at the summary of the biomarker data from these um, infants, interestingly, even though the serum ferritin was higher in the iron and zinc fortified and iron fortified cereal groups than the meat group. None of that was statistically significant. So it actually didn't make a huge difference to the iron biomarkers, what group that you were in. The only slight difference was there was a slight significant difference in transferrin receptors that could suggest that they were slightly more iron deficient. But apart from that, there was very, even despite the lower iron intake, there was little difference in the iron biomarkers. But to me, what is the most interesting thing, wait for it, is that the gut microbiome in these infants 
was quite different. So I don't profess to be an expert in microbiota or microorganisms or any of that stuff, but I do like these coloured charts that you get from them. <laughs> because um, I can kind of understand coloured things. Um, what this chart shows is the different types of phyla or um, bacterial species that they found in the faecal specimens of these infants. And this is the first group here. So this is your iron zinc fortified cereal group. Then you've got the iron fortified cereal group and this is the M for the meat group. And the subject numbers are here. So not every single infant in the study had them, their microbiome looked at. And this is by age, six, seven, eight, nine, five, six, seven, eight, nine months in this subject, five. So from really around about five to nine months of age. And it shows how the fecal microbiome changed with feeding of these different complementary foods. To me, what's most striking is there is this difference in here, in these blue things, which are called, I can't even pronounce them properly, firmucutes. Um, there's significantly more of those in the meat group as compared to the, the complementary um, or the cereal groups. And in the cereal groups, there's many more bacteroidetes uh, microorganisms found. So I think this is really interesting. Now, according to the authors, the firmicutes in here are of a phyla or a type, I should say, of bacteria which is predominated by Clostridia. And apparently Clostridia is very good at producing butyrate, and butyrate we know is very, very important for normal colon function in terms of keeping our cells very healthy within our colon. Whereas these bacteroides are probably more iron-liking and are probably feeding more off the iron that is not absorbed from the iron cereal and producing more prolifically in the colon. And the authors say, this is a very small study, it's early days, and it, it might not be that this has any health consequence to the infant, but I think two things it illustrates to me is these bugs are getting iron from somewhere, and they must be getting it from some of the unabsorbed iron that they're not absorbing from the breakfast cereal. And the meat iron is obviously creating a different type of gut microbiota, uh, or development of a different gut microbiota. So I thought this was really fascinating. And obviously, small study, a lot more needs to be done. Um, but I think this is something we, should, we need to look more, more at. And maybe we can do that here in, in New Zealand. So I would like to just finish off then with um, some, just some guidelines, what we've really kind of learned, I suppose, from over the years from our research. Um, exclusive breastfeeding till around six months of age um, is really important. And it does provide an adequate source of iron um, for the full-term infant. If not breastfed, it's recommended to use an infant formula until at least 12 months of age. Don't offer cow's milk as a, as a drink until at least 12 months of age. It's okay to offer it um, within um, foods, but not to offer it as a, as a whole drink. Um, at six, six months, a complementary source of dietary iron from weaning foods is necessary, and I say get on with meat quickly. Um, it could even be the first uh, complementary food given to an infant as long as it's in the right form. Um, so introduce meat into the diet, I say between six to seven months, but definitely before seven months. And from 12 months of age, offer a broad range of nutrient-dense family foods. Thank you. Any questions? <laughs>